Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 205, recorded on September 4th, 2021. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes, from an extremely hot Tucson, Arizona. Let's do the news. And we start with a historic moment for SUSE, the release of SUSE Rancher 2.6. 2.6 is hot on the heels of SUSE's Q2 numbers, the company's first earnings as a public company since their Ranger Labs acquisition. Key takeaways from the investor briefing were the company's confirmation of an annual run rate of $519 million, growth of 16% on the prior year, and perhaps most interestingly, Rancher had an annual run rate of $50 million. That's up 91%. Those are your numbers the market notices, and those are numbers that matter to Seuss. Rancher 2.6's release is Rancher now under the SUSE umbrella. It is an evolution of that brand now, and they've kept it with a minor point release. And I think that's actually pretty clever by SUSE. We'll get into that in a moment. But their main goal here with Rancher is to continue to position Rancher as a Kubernetes agnostic management offering. To that end, this latest release supports any cloud-native computing foundation certified Kubernetes distribution. For on-premises workloads, there's the Rancher Kubernetes engine, which runs entirely within Docker containers. And of course, SUSE Rancher supports all the public cloud distributions, doubling down on their efforts to remain cloud agnostic and vendor neutral, a key selling point of Rancher. So what's new in 2.6? Well, actually quite a bit. And it leads one to suspect when you look at all these changes, they avoided bumping the version to 3.0 simply just to set expectations with customers that, hey, this product you love, this rancher, it's not going to be radically different under SUS. But when you look at it, it has a whole new improved user experience and a new UI at, at the top level. They've re-architected some key workflows. That right there alone, some companies would, <laughs> would bump the version number over. And under the hood, they've improved security and they've also strengthened compliance capabilities. But it seems like a lot of engineering work went into rebuilding the containers that Rancher deploys. Of course, when you set up a Rancher deployment, it's going to spin up a lot of the services that you need inside containers automatically. Previously, those containers were based on Alpine and Debian predominantly. But now, they've reworked it so they're all based on SUSE Enterprise Linux. And in addition to that... SUSE Rancher 2.6 also has added the SUSE Linux Enterprise base container images. So think universal base images, a containerized subset of RHEL, but for SUSE Linux Enterprise. And, and, and of course, because you got to have acronyms for all this enterprise stuff, they're calling it the SLEE BCI. <laughs> I'm not sure that name is really going to stick in my mind. But really, my question is, what took them so long? At this point, and Chris, I think you'd agree... With so many management platforms out there now, the real issue facing IT teams isn't really can they find something that works to manage Kubernetes, but really it's determining the best way to manage a multi-cloud, maybe with some on-premises components, and a whole bunch of solutions that you've already deployed in production. You need something that's going to work with all of that. And really, Seuss Rancher is known for solving that problem. With 2.6, they're investing even more into that strategy. Well, sticking in the container space for one more story. It seems that Docker Inc. has managed to piss off more of their commercial users this week. The company has announced that their free plan is now a, quote, personal plan and requires that businesses with 250 or more employees, or if that business earns more than $10 million in annual revenue, it must pay a subscription if they require the use of Docker Desktop. And they very well might if they're using Docker on a Mac or a Windows machine. Now, there are no changes to the command line Docker engine, but that only runs on Linux. In addition to that new personal plan, there's also a $5 per month pro plan and a $7 per month team subscription. Both of those are left unchanged. There's also a new $21 per month business subscription that adds centralized management single sign-on, and, quote, enhanced security. That's $21 per user, and I could see that adding up really quick. I mean, at that price, you might as well start swapping people over to desktop Linux and save money. Sadly, this is truly the forever story of Docker Inc., and I do mean sadly. How the hell are they going to make money? It seems to be the perpetual question, and watching the way they've just jerked around Mac and Windows users over this last year alone, it well, it's starting to look pretty desperate over there at Docker. 
And speaking of growing a company based on an open source product, MongoDB just had a rather impressive quarter. In a recent interview, their CEO also shared some new details about their customer base. So we have all types of customers. We now have 29,000 customers. We have some of the largest brands in the world, uh, people like Toyota, AT&T, Morgan Stanley, Verizon, etc., as well as cutting edge startups and new breed companies like UiPath and Data Robot, who are building their business on top of MongoDB. And that's what you're seeing in our results. It was the best quarter we've had to date. And it appears the U.S. government may be another potential source of growth for the MongoDB. Their database as a service product that we've talked about before called Atlas just received a new level of compliance approval for use in the U.S. federal government. They already use MongoDB on-premises quite a bit, and it seems the U.S. government is quite interested in the hosted solution from the company. As the clock ticks towards December 31st, we watch and wait to see how the CentOS community will handle the upcoming transition to stream. We know Red Hat won't support CentOS 8 past the end of the year, but now someone has stepped up to provide updates and support till the end of 2025. Cloud Linux has announced it will provide those updates and much-needed support for CentOS 8, giving users a new lifeline and more time to work out their plans. This seems both good and bad to me, Wes. Uh, From a practical standpoint, it seems useful for the market. No doubt many CentOS 8 users will want to take Cloud Linux up on this. That just seems obvious to me. However, (laughs) it also seems like it will slow adoption of both their own Alma Linux alternative and CentOS Stream, which ultimately, um, I suspect it just would have been better for the industry at large to just accept, adapt, and then transition to. We've been keeping an eye on the framework laptop, the modular machine with a big nod to the right to repair. This week, they've posted specifics for getting the best results with Linux on the hardware. They note it mostly comes down to driver support in the kernel, with the relative newness of their Wi-Fi card being a particular challenge. They also point out that the Goodix based fingerprint reader will require a newer kernel, and at least version 1.92 of libfprint, which is the library for the fingerprint reader. Makes sense. But really, you can just sum it all up by saying this. If you want to use Linux on a framework laptop, run Linux kernel 5.12 or newer. Yeah, that's really it. They note just about everything else works great with Linux out of the box, including those neat USB-C swappable hardware modules. Check the link in the show notes for more information on the framework Linux community. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on your new account, and you go there to support the show, of course. Linode started in 2003 as one of the very first companies in cloud computing. I mention that because I think one of the most common questions I get, Wes and I got it this morning before we started recording the show, hey guys, why should I choose Linode over XYZ provider? Because there are a lot of ways to host with Linode. And Wes responded with, well, I like the fact that Linode is independently owned. You know, it's not some like crazy VC funded thing. Like they make money and they survive on the merits of their product. And I was like, that's a good one. I like Linode because they're fast. (laughs) And then that other stuff I learned about later and I really appreciated that. But what really made Linode stick with me is their speed and their performance. They are their own ISP. They've got 11 data centers around the world. They have a brilliant interface to let you manage all of this. And then the systems themselves, what really matter, are screamers. They're really fast. Linode has really just been focused on making cloud computing accessible, affordable, and high performance since 2003. That's 18 years of dialing this thing in. So when you ask me, what's different about Linode? Well, it's everything that would come from focus like that and from being independently owned and having a true love for the underlying technology. That's what's different about Linode. That's why I stick with them. That's why I'm comfortable running my business platform on Linode. And honestly, it's really the best-in-class experience from the best customer support in the business to the interface, to the UI, to everything down at a technical level. And then I really appreciate all of the little extras that they have, like their S3-compatible object storage, cloud firewalls, VLAN support, their powerful DNS manager, and ultimately, their support for the community for projects in open source, and of course, for things like this here, Humble Podcast. There's so much you could learn. There's so much you could try. So that's why they're giving you $100 in 60-day credit. But you got to go to linode.com slash land. That does a few things. It lets them know you heard about it here. It says, hey, 
it is worth your time and money investing in Linux Action News. It also gives you that $100 credit and it lets you try things out. Like maybe go install iPerf on Linode and install it on another machine on your end and do some performance testing there. Go try out a distribution you've never played around with and take advantage of the fact that you've got snapshots. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do, I'll spin up something on Linode just to avoid having to spin something up in a VM on my laptop to make it warm because really it's so quick, it's so simple. I can deploy the entire base stack in like one click or I can do a whole DIY setup if that's how I prefer. You just got to get started. So go get that $100 credit today. Sign up at linode.com slash LAN. Linux.ting.com. Have you heard the word? No, it's not the bird. It's Ting. Let's go see how much you could save right now and <laughs> take 25 bucks off of that. Linux.ting.com. The trick is they're an MVNO or a mobile virtual network operator. That means Ting customers get access to all the big carrier networks, the ones you've heard of, the nationwide coast-to-coast coverage that you look at on the coverage maps. You get access to that but you just pay less. That's why I've been a Ting customer since 2013. They've stayed flexible with me when I'm on the road. They've got great plans, and I love their new plans. They make it great for an individual, a family, or a small business. I like to mention the Set 12 because I think that really hits the sweet spot. Go check that one out. They got a whole bunch. Get started at linux.ting.com. But Set 12 gives you 12 gigs of data and unlimited talk and text for 35 bucks a month. <laughs> How nice is that? You just don't even have to worry about it. I mean, you sync your music and your podcast while you're on Wi-Fi and you're pretty much good to go. But if you use two gigs or you use 20 gigs, there's a Ting plan for you. And every plan gets access to Ting's award-winning customer service with nationwide LTE and 5G coverage. It's simple to switch to Ting. Pretty much any phone will work. So just head to linux.ting.com. Check your current phone, create an account, and pick the plan that's right for you. Once everything checks out, Ting will just send you a SIM card in the mail. You pop that in your phone and you get activated in minutes. And they've got a nice, clean process for all of it. And while you're there, go check out the Ting blog. They often are doing giveaways or helping with tips on battery life. There's a lot you can learn just from their blog. It's something that I've read for years now. So cut your current phone bill in half. It's never been easier with Ting's brand new plans. It is truly the next generation of Ting Mobile. It's here and go see how much you could save and then take 25 bucks off that. Linux.ting.com. Just a couple of quick stories to round us out today. We've got to get Chris out of here before he melts. It's actually over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in his recording spot right now. So first, it seems the RISC-V platform might be getting a boost from a rather unlikely source. Apple is exploring using the open source alternative to ARM CPUs in future devices, at least according to a recent job posting. Yeah, the job posting is rather revealing, and I would expect to see Apple use this for IoT-type devices, you know, dongles and their HomePod-type gadgets. In fact, a few of Apple's cables, like the Lightning to Headphone cable, actually have tiny, tiny ARM computers in them doing digital to analog conversions already. Yeah, that makes sense. And maybe this way there'll be a few fewer ARM license fees to pay. And while we're speaking of Apple hardware, the much-anticipated IOMMU driver required for PCIe, Wi-Fi, USB, display support, and almost everything else on the M1 platform has finally been merged upstream by Linus into the upcoming 515 kernel. This is a huge milestone, Wes. This is huge. It's now being merged by Linus, and this is a lot of what it takes to get Linux running on an M1. And let's not forget how great it is, too, that this is landing upstream. It's not like some crazy fork of Linux. Obviously, GPU support is still a big, maybe the biggest hurdle, but we're already seeing progress steadily be made in that direction, too. But speaking of things landing in Linux 5.15... One of the earliest pull requests sent in for 5.15 was KSMBD, an in-kernel SMB3 file server developed by Samsung. Now, KSMBD isn't designed to replace our beloved Samba. Instead, it's focusing on delivering really fast SMB3 file server performance and also supporting some interesting features that can be far more easily implemented in kernel space. Things like RDMA support for SMB Direct, which can help offload some of the SMB workload to supported network cards. Not just that, Wes, but also they said this is just going to work better for some Linux workloads on smaller devices that need to host files. What I was mostly curious about is will they integrate with the existing Samba user tools? And it appears they will, at least they say, where appropriate. 
And the Samsung developers have worked with the Samba team to make sure that some of the configuration files work right. Things like extended attributes are supported and compatible. And really, (laughs) I never thought this was actually going to get merged. (laughs) I never thought Linus would merge a file server into the kernel. But when we read through this in some workloads, I I start thinking to myself, yeah, actually, I could see myself using this. (laughs) So maybe I'm actually glad to see it land. You know, I didn't expect it either. But if you do use it, make sure you've got a firewall. That's a great point, Wes. Like, how many Android devices is this going to get installed on from Samsung that are just connected to an LTE network all the time or a 5G network? I'll tell you what, though, when 5.15 ships, I think we're going to be pretty tempted to try it out. So check out linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to keep in touch. And if you want to hear more on the Framework laptop, Cassidy joined us and gave us his take. He's had it for a while. So check out linuxunplugged.com slash 419. As for us, we'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week.